uh, because I remember the, the day that it actually sunk in, because I remember that we talked about this, it was just to me, as numbers, it didn't make sense. So what we're going to do is visualize this a little bit better. So let's say I have this, and it's right at 32 degrees. Can it be 32 degrees and not be a solid? Yes, yes. yes it is possible. Now, this is about one pound of water. Approximately, it's really close to one pound of water right here. So if I wanted to change this from 32 degrees liquid to 33 degrees liquid, how much energy would that be? Who said that? One BTU. That's exactly right. That's literally the definition of a BTU. Yes, one BTU. We change one pound of water, one degree Fahrenheit. That's one BTU. What if I change it from 32 liquid to 30? Three liquid. Oh, sorry, 34 liquid. <coughs> there we go. And as I continuously raise this one degree Fahrenheit, one pound of water, what does my BTUs do? It keeps going up. Or I could have more volume of water, but that's still a BTU. So we talk about BTUs all the time. We can't really visualize it. So here you can actually visualize it. You can really visualize it. Now, if I took this from 32 degree liquid to 212 degrees liquid, not yet boiling, but 212 degrees liquid, how many BTUs would that be? 180. Love when people do math because that's not my strong point. Yes, how many? 180 BTUs. So imagine that I was to take this at 32 degrees and pour it on you. Could you imagine how that would feel? Think about how that would feel. Is this just only one pound, but I poured it on you at 32 degrees. Now as I heat it up to 212 degrees and then pour that on you, how would that feel? So now, you'd probably kill me. 180 BTUs. Would that be a significant difference? Let's put one hand in 32 degree water and one hand at 212 degrees water. Would that be a significant difference? That's 180 BTUs. That's sensible. That is significant. You got to admit. 32 liquid, 212 liquid. Now, if we made this change state from a liquid to a vapor at the same temperature, 970 BTUs of heat energy. Now, if 180 was significant, what about 970? That's latent heat. Sensible heat's a change in temperature, but latent heat, it didn't change temperature at all. 970 BTUs. You ever notice you take a shower, you get out of the shower and you go to the next room or you're standing in front of a fan, what's the temperature your body start to do? It starts to drop. Well, your body temperature is warm. You're in a warm shower. Everything's warm. You get out of the shower and all of a sudden you start feeling cold because the water is the refrigerant the water is changing state from your skin from a liquid to a vapor it didn't have to be at 212 it can be at a lower it's evaporation changing state from liquid to vapor as it's changing state it's latent heat it's literally cooling your body off rapidly cooling your body off latent heat is way more powerful than sensible heat all the different refrigerants have different B2 capacities where they absorb different amounts of heat when they're changing state. But that changing state is so important. We can see the difference between all liquid, all sensible. But when we get to that latent heat, that's the magic of refrigeration. So that evaporator, that refrigerant, say it's boiling from a liquid over here to a vapor, it's absorbing a massive amount of heat. And the condenser is changing state from a vapor all the way back to a liquid. It's rejecting a massive amount of heat. Now, I talked about boiling effect being a cooling effect. Anybody uh, started out like me where you had to eat ramen every day? Nobody? So there's going to be one person, right? One? Thank you. All right. We're going we're gonna to get along. We know what it's like to feel the suffering, right? So um, now, have you ever cooked, when you cooked, since there's only one person, now, when you ever cooked ramen, you ever, uh, you're hungry, you put it in the stove, you start cooking it, then you go watch the game or have a beer and forget about it? Never. Now it's just me. What happens as I have the stove on and it's still cooking? What happens to, to visualize this for me? Whatever it takes. What happens to that water level as we leave the stove on? It reduces. It reduces because it's changing state. The water boiling, changing state for liquid vapor, is keeping the rest of the water at a saturated 212 degrees. It's keeping it at a cool 212 degrees. But what happens when all of this water boils to a vapor? There's no more water left. What happens? It, I can definitely contest that it does burn. And then you have to move to a new apartment because you can't get the smell out. It's horrible. It's second to burning popcorn. It is bad. 
So the water boiling is a cooling effect. Now we think of boiling water as being hot, but according to the water itself, it's a cooling effect. It's changing state, keeping itself at a saturated 212 degrees. Now, can we boil water at lower than 212 degrees? Yes. Absolutely. You go up to the mountains, you boil water at a lower temperature. Now, if I'm boiling water at, say, say I'm boiling water at 190 degrees, high altitude, 190 degrees, does it take longer to cook the food or shorter to cook the food? It takes longer to cook the food because I have to keep it at this temperature for a longer amount of time for the heat to go into the food. So boiling, though, the water is still cooling. It's keeping, we change the pressure. We change the atmospheric pressure. We change the boiling temperature, but it takes longer to, to make it uh, cook the food. I could actually make this water boil in this room. I can put it into a vacuum, make it boil. I can make it boil right here in this room. We can, I can bring a pot in here, put a vacuum chamber on it. You can see it violently bubbling, boiling away. We can make it boil right here at 80 degrees, 75 degrees. You can take the temperature of this water and it will drop in temperature as it's boiling. What would happen if you stuck your finger in it right after it got done boiling? <clears throat> this one's a catchy one. What, what, what would happen right after it got done boiling in a vacuum chamber and you were to put your finger in that boiling water? <clears throat> your finger would get wet. Yeah. <laughs> it would still be at the 75 degrees. So boiling doesn't mean hot. Boiling means it's changing state. Now, to us and our lively and our experience, we think of it as water boiling, but I can make water boil in a vacuum. And any refrigerant is the same thing. We can make refrigerants boil at different temperatures by changing the pressure. R22, 410A, they're going to be changing refrigerants again, and then probably after that again, and probably after that again. But as long as we understand, in the evaporator cool, we need to make it boil from a liquid to a vapor, and that has a pressure attached to it. And a condenser cool, we need to make it go from a vapor back to a liquid and it's got a pressure attached to it and it's that latent heat that changes state that makes it happen and we're golden if we don't have refrigerant to change state in that evaporator coil if we don't have any liquid refrigerant in that evaporator coil to change state how would you think it's cooling not well at all i've seen that plenty of times we're not cooling at all we have to have liquid refrigerant changing state there's still heat transfer taking place, but it's a very small amount because it's only sensible. After I make all this water boil over here to 212, I can then heat up even more. I can superheat it into a vapor. Superheated vapor. Now, can I cool water down below 212? Yeah. Yeah. That'd be a subcooled liquid. So below the saturation point, subcooled liquid. Above the saturation point, we're going to talk about this again here in a minute. So the, on a refrigeration cycle, it's that latent heat right here that's the magic of what we do. Changing state. It's not about pressure here. People call me, hey, my pressures are this and that. Cool. See you later. <laughs> I want to know what's the subcooling. I want to know over here, what's the superheat? Superheat, my compressor, any compressor we have, it breathes a superheated vapor. If you try to feed it a liquid, it's going to die. The meter device needs, it needs a subcooled liquid. If we don't have a subcooled liquid, it can't do its job. Superheat and subcooling is very important. Now, when we get to refrigeration, a lot of times we don't have subcooling. We have the sight glass to make sure that we still have a full column of liquid going to that meeting device. We'll go to that more in a minute. Yes, sir. Uh, I have a question. Sure. So we went over the process from water to vapor. Is there a similar for water to ice? Yes. Like That's a great question. Yes. It is also latent heat, but we go from 32 degrees liquid to 32 degrees solid. That is also latent heat. Now, when you get into CO2, it's going to be a very important factor. But just to answer your question, yes, how many BTUs to make solid ice change state from 32 degrees solid to 32 degrees liquid? Uh, 970. Oh, you would think so. It was a trick question. You would think so. Zero, that's the other question you get all the time because it's no temperature change. 144 BTUs. It takes 144 BTUs to melt one pound of ice. Coincidentally, if you take this, this will fill up an ice tray. Uh, I'm maybe too old. Maybe you guys don't use ice trays anymore, but it's still what, one pound of water. To melt that one pound of water, it's 144 BTUs. This is the reason we use ice when we go camping. We use ice to keep our beer cool because the ice changing state is absorbing 144 BTUs for every single pound you buy a five pound thing of ice 
5 times 144? It's a lot. So that's, that's a significant amount of heat. So 144 times 5. Um, I'm looking at you. I know you can do math. <laughs> Somebody got it? I'm recording on my phone, so I can't use Google. 720? Is that right? 720 BTUs. Now, if I only use 32 degrees water, 32 degrees water, that would be 5 BTUs. So if I had only water in my cooler at, at uh, 32 degrees, or I had ice at 32 degrees, 700 and something BTUs versus 5 BTUs? Absolutely. That's the power of latent heat also, but yes. Uh, and then you can even cool it below a solid. Once you cool it below a solid, it's only half a BTU. Half a BTU. And once you go here at superheated vapor, it's only half a BTU. Over here, that's where we have the one-to-one, -one, one BTU for water. But when you get into CO2 and CO2 classes, that's going to be very important because you're going to have CO2 going from a, uh, well, actually, you don't want it going from a, a liquid to a solid, but you also end up with a triple point. And you get a lot of, it's a whole other class we have on that. But it's a good point. You're thinking about that latent heat that changes states. It isn't nearly as powerful as the vaporization, but it is very powerful. Also doesn't tend to move very well. What's that? But it also doesn't tend to move very it, well. It, it's really hard to move it. I saw a YouTube video to where a guy invented a uh, refrigerator cooler using rubber bands. Didn't work all that great, but it's cool because as the rubber bands expanded, it absorbed heat inside, and as they condensed on the outside, or they restricted on the outside, condensed. So they actually use rubber bands on a wheel, just constantly expanding and contracting rubber bands. It's the only thing I've seen with a solid using refrigeration and completely impractical, but it was cool thinking about a solid doing it. But yes, the point is very difficult moving a solid. So we like to use liquids and vapors. It's a great question. Did that answer it for you? Yes, sir. Excellent. Why airflow across the evaporator? This is one of the biggest overlooked things is airflow, airflow, airflow. If we look over here at our evaporator coil, <clears throat> we need to get that refrigerator to change state from a liquid to a vapor, and it takes heat to make that happen. If I don't have airflow, I don't have enough heat going across the evaporator coil. So what happens to my refrigerant? Nothing. It stays at that saturated mixture. It doesn't change to a vapor, and we get liquid coming out of our evaporator coil to our vapor pump, and we kill it, all because we didn't have airflow. <clears throat> True Tech tool, not True Tech, uh, TEC makes a really cool thing for measuring airflow in your actual CF films. Most of the time I ask people, hey, what's your airflow? It's good. <clears throat> Red flag. <laughs> it's good is not an answer. So I'm like, okay, let's go back and let's measure. There's eight different ways of checking airflow. Airflow. Is it airflow across the vapor or good? If you don't have good airflow, it doesn't matter. Talk about the people changing filters. If that filter is too restricted, that filter is dirty, we don't have enough airflow, and that kills compressors. <clears throat> not changing the filters, big killer compressors, dirt on the evaporator coil, all the blowers labs, we just slowed the fan speed down. All these things, we have to have it balanced, we have to have enough airflow to boil that refrigerant to vapor. It is critical. Bad duct systems. How about walk-in freezers? Who works in walk-in freezers, walk-in coolers? Right, you see that nice little cool line? Don't stack above this line. No, because you can't see it because they already stacked it above the line. You don't have airflow. Same thing happens. Airflow, airflow. Airflow, airflow, it's so overlooked. And verify superheat and subcooling. <clears throat> System pressures. Hey, people call me about pressures. Hey, my pressures are uh, by, I don't care about your pressures. For the most part, I want superheat and subcooling. But our pressures, what we do is we convert this pressure to what? Temperature. Saturated temperature. Pressure converts to a saturated temperature. So anytime I say saturated, I want your first thought to be PSIG, PSI gauge, converted to a saturated temperature. PSIG gauge converted to a PSIG gauge converted to a PSIG gauge converted to a one person's got it. Yes. One person out of 30. Good. Saturated temperature. Convert that to a saturated temperature. What's the temperature of your evaporator coil? What's the temperature the refrigerant's boiling at? What's the temperature the refrigerant's condensing at? That's what I want to know. That's my baseline. If my saturated temperature is the same temperature as air, am I going to be absorbing heat? Nope. 
my saturated temperature needs to be lower than the temperature of the air to absorb heat. What about outside? What about the condenser? <clears throat> Higher. I get people calling me all the time. Hey, my pressure, uh, it's low. What, what do you mean low? Let's give some, some points to go with. What's our outdoor temperature versus our liquid saturated temperature? This temperature should be higher than the air temperature. Old units and ref old refrigeration, it used to be 30, 35 degrees. Now with some of the high efficiency stuff, <clears throat> it's only a 10 degree difference. So what was high pressure then may not be high pressure now. Now we have what, 250 something different types of refrigerant? Saturated temperature though, that could be something to work with. I can compare that. So please don't call me with just pressures. I want saturated temperatures. We'll work on that. All right, so here we can get our, your, uh, your app out, your Emerson PT Pro. We're gonna convert some pressures to temperatures for some superheat calculations <clears throat> using our app. There's an app for that. In my day, we had to use that PT chart. And, and when I was young, it wasn't an issue, but now that I'm older, those numbers get smaller. They get smaller, like they make them shrink as you get older. I don't know why they do that. <laughs> That's right, right here. So we got four 10A refrigerant and we're gonna have 100 PSIG. Do I want 100 PSIG? Is that PSIG gonna be something Ty wants to know? No, 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 no. Well, we're gonna convert that to a saturated temperature. When you get your app opened up, you're gonna select four 10A. You're gonna put the vapor pressure PSI gauge, 100 PSI. And sometimes uh, the apples will put it in bar and um, I like the bar, but not for calculations here in the U.S. So we're going to change it to PSI. Let's make sure it's on PSI. So have a 100 PSI gauge. Make sure it's on Fahrenheit. If you're in the U.S., you cross the border, maybe you have to change it. So once you get a 100 PSI, does anybody have what their saturated temperature should be? 31.5. What's that? 31.5. 31.5. So if it's at a 100 PSI gauge, the refrigerant over here, the refrigerant would be boiling at what temperature? 31.5, boiling, changing state from a liquid to vapor. Anything significant about 31.5? Below freezing. Below freezing, what's gonna to happen to the moisture in the air? It's gonna start freezing the coil. People say, oh, uh, low refrigerant is the main thing to cause it. The main thing is airflow. The pressure drops, we have less heat, we have less pressure, pressure drops, we're gonna start freezing. Turn into an ice machine. All right? if you didn't find that one, not a problem, we're gonna do another one. We're going to change refrigerants to 404A. Ah, another one that's going to be going away. I sure love 404A. It's a Canadian number. 404A? 70 PSI gauge. 30.4. Wait a minute. What was the temperature we had with this one? Look how close we are, but a big pressure difference. Let's do the next one. We'll go over down here to 4 today. 500 PSI gauge. 500. Wow. 500. It's a crazy high number. 133.7. So what number is that going to be most likely? 133.7. Where's that going to be here? It's about the middle section of this condensing coil. Somewhere right in here. It's going to be actually that temperature. When it was at 31 point something degrees, where was it going to be here? From the meeting device through, depending on the charge, most of the coil. Where it's saturation, where it's liquid and vapor together. Oh, it had the answers right there. Dave knew that I wasn't going to do the math in my head, so he put it on this slide for me. 